good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Welcome to this GFCon 21 panel discussion. Uh, we're here to talk about global brands from sponsorship to partnership. Now, as esports continues to grow and evolve as an activity, uh, so too has interest in brands and seeing esports as a vehicle to achieve their um, business and organizational objectives. And while the norm has been around, you know, around brand and esports relationships have been, you know, sponsorship as a, a tradition, you know, in, in, in the relatively young years of esports, we are starting to see a shift towards a more value focused centered uh, partnerships as the mode of participation for brands in, in this esports space. So, um, you know, we're, we're here today. Uh, objective here today is to share some brand and esports industry perspectives around this shifting mode of engagement from sponsorship to partnerships, and to also consider how you know ready esports is to welcome partnerships, or you know how esports can also offer new ways of partnerships that have you know not been seen before. So now it is my pleasure to introduce to you. Um, the, sorry, Lawrence, you okay? Good, good. Okay, cool. Uh, maybe we'll, we'll just kind of, I'll, I'll just like redo that a bit again. Okay. Um, so it is my pleasure to introduce to you um, Ricardo Ford, founder, Sport by Ford Consulting, Carlos Alimuro, CEO of One Esports, Kat Gong, Senior Brand Manager Tencent, and Lawrence Chan, Managing Director of My Republic. Uh, I'm Tiaming, I'm a GSIC ambassador, and I'll be a moderator for today. So welcome, everybody. Um, and let, let, let's get going. Um, well, I think for the very bit first, uh, we'll, we'll talk about the topic of the discussion, um, sponsorships to partnerships. And you know, we'll, we'll kick off with this first. Um, what are the differences between sponsorships and partnerships? Um, maybe we'll, we'll start with Kat, ladies first. Uh, thank you. I think the difference between the partnership and sponsorship, it really depends on how deeply we interact, interact with each other. So the old way of sponsorship is kind of like you invest money and resources and you receive advertisement, you receive exposure. It's a sell and buy logic, plain and simple. Um, but partnership, I think, from my perspective, is about to finding the real common interest in this cooperation. So esports industry, they actually encourage the diversified mode of cooperation. Let's put it this way. Um, in the early age, uh, in the early stage of esports, we kind of only receive sponsors from the hardware, the computers, the keyboard, the mouse, and all the sort of things. But now when you look at the brand that we are collaborating with, you will find food and beverage, cars, hotels, banks, and even luxuries. Uh, I'm uh, Louis Vuitton I'm referring to. So um, from my perspective, a really good brand, a deep partnership will help esports tell its own story, uh, of course, of a um, very positive social value. So actually, um, through this brand, uh, also through this partnership, one by one, we kind of establish a different, we esports establish a different impression to the public, we kind of demonstrate that esports is not only a little hobby of a small group of people, but it can become a lifestyle. It's my idea. Esports is becoming a lifestyle of the young generation. So this kind of idea brings more people, more investors, and more brand to focus their resources and eyes on esports, not only in the arena only or the online broadcasting or streaming through the internet only, but now we can say that we are collaborating in many offline scenarios, including hotel, including cafe, and uh, many other different, uh, even supermarkets, many uh, offline scenarios, and also in many brand crossover cases. Now we do the clothes, we do shoes, uh, we now even do some furniture with IKEA too. So, so this is my idea about the difference between partnership and sponsorship. Thanks, thanks for sharing, Kat. Um, Ricardo, you spent uh, you know uh, many years in the more traditional sports industry space, and I think you've also seen the evolution of of sponsorships to partnerships. So I, I would like you to uh, I was just wondering if you could help us uh, you know also um, share with you, from your perspective as well the differences that you've seen between sponsorship and partnerships, as well as you know the differences you see between um, partnerships in the sports 
traditional sports space and this emerging esports space. Okay, well, thank you uh, for having me as a as part of this panel. It's a, a pleasure to share the screen uh, with all of you um, and talk a little bit about uh, uh, partnerships and and, and and esports in general. Um, for me, I think the basic difference between the sponsorship and the partnership is. Um, the, the sponsorship is more of a one-way street. You know, I'm paying you to give me stuff and can be intellectual property, can be tickets, can be access. Uh, whereas in the uh, partnership, there is a collaboration and there is uh, a flow of you know, goods between the two sides or services or, or, or um, uh, ideas. So both sides benefit beyond the, the money. And these are usually uh, the, the best ways to work when the rights holder uh, and the sponsor, they can, they can share things, they have things in common, and they can work together to find solutions that benefit both sides, in addition to the money, in addition to all the other things that a sponsorship can, uh, can offer. Uh, now, when it comes to your second question, and you're talking about the, the similarities and the differences between uh, a traditional sponsorship in, in sports or entertainment and in esports, I think that the need for for being authentic, for being real, for understanding the language of the the, the esports community, it's much greater than it is in sports. Now, in sports, a brand can you know, can can survive not understanding completely how those things interested in, you now you can say football or in rugby, whatever sport you go, uh, you, you can survive, you can, you can be uh, accepted in any of these sports sponsorships if you're not completely fluent in that sport. Uh, when it comes to, I think, to esports, the, the requirements from the players, the fans, you know, everybody that lives in this, um, in this ecosystem are, are much greater. So I don't think that the esports fans are as forgiven to brands that try to pretend they belong there, but they actually don't. Uh, so you have to understand. You have to, you know, you have to understand how how they speak. What are the codes? What are the languages? Uh, what are the behaviors that are accepted for brands to be part of and to be accepted uh, by this uh, the, by this group? So in that sense, it's more it's more challenging for a marketer for a sponsor to find a right space to do the right thing and be successful uh, working with um, uh, in esports that's why the need for collaboration with the rights holders with the, you know publishers is so much greater than it is in sports so when i think about now going back to the first question when i think about the need for for a collaboration for a partnership in esports it's, it is for me much greater than it is in in sports Thank you, Ricardo. And 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 I think you know, you know, given your response as well as well as what Kat has said as well, you know, as we are looking at the more exciting possibilities of the non-endemic brands coming into the space, I think we need to also start thinking a lot more around uh, partnerships rather than 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 sponsorships, so that they also feel a bit safer in, in coming in. And and on that note, um, Carlos, how ready are is esports for partnerships? Uh, well, first of all, uh, just like Ricardo and Kat, uh, you know, and, and Lawrence here, just want to thank you for the opportunity to to speak today uh, about esports, something that um, all of us are su uh, super deeply passionate about. Um, to answer your question around how ready is our brands in esports, I, I think uh, the the simple answer is, um, you know, the smartest brands have entered already. Uh, you know, if if you're a smart brand and you haven't um, at least piloted a couple, a few strategies in esports in the last, you know, particularly the last two years, uh, you know, I would argue you're you're a little bit behind the, the ball there. Um, so I think when it comes to uh, brands entering the space, I think the smart brands have already entered the space. If you're not one of those brands, I, I would suggest really working hard. Uh, with maybe a few of us on the panel here to get you into this space, because I truly honestly believe that esports is the future of sports and entertainment. Now, what I will say, and, and I'll tie in a few of the things that my um, uh, fellow um, uh, panelists have talked about, you know, I, I think there is um, definitely agree with Ricardo that 
the 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 level of authenticity um, and, and scrutiny that the esports fan is going to exhibit in this space is higher than, let's say, in American football or football or or any other traditional stick and ball sport. But what I will say also is that the smart brands understand that it's not just about authenticity. Like, for instance, you can have an incredibly authentic, um, you know, short form video that you that that you were involved with, or an incredibly authentic um, on site activation. But authenticity in, 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 is only one dimension in which you you're going to win over this community. The way we like to define it with our partners, and we have a you know several you know, a lot of case studies around this, it's not only about exhibiting authenticity, it's about exhibiting commitment. And commitment is a very different bar than than authenticity. Authenticity, you can you know look at your calendar and you know do a couple of check marks during the year, and then you're authentic, you're good. That's not going to win you this community. What you need to do is show commitment. And our definition of commitment is that you got to participate across the entire fan experience. And that's why One Esports has built essentially a fully scaled media company that includes events, esports news, long form, short form streaming content, um, data and analytics. And so when brands work with One Esports, they get the entire um, access to the fan through our entire a content flywheel. And then to touch on the, I think this first question around the definition of sponsorship and partnership, the way I like to define the difference is what's the impact on the fan? In my mind, the definition of a sponsorship is all that the fan is really going to see is a logo, a logo on a jersey, a logo on a stage, logo on, on a stream, a partnership. And, you know, Kat had touched on this a little bit is is it, and also Ricardo is how can you take one plus one and make that equal three? And so you got to take, you got to harness all of the assets and capabilities of both companies to access the community across the entire fan experience as they're going through with it. Um, I think the, the last thing I would say is one of the big differences in traditional stick and ball, stick and ball sports and in esports is that if you really think about stick and ball, uh, traditional sports, that fan experience is actually at, at a national level quite inter vertically integrated, right? Like there is a league that does an, essentially an exclusive media rights deal. And so from the fan perspective, the storytelling, the experience for traditional stick and ball sports is actually quite integrated and pretty seamless. The problem in esports is that it's not like that. It's incredibly flat. It's highly distributed. And so this is why there is a, a tighter requirement around not only authenticity, but also commitment and being involved across the entire content flywheel. Thank you, Carlos. And, and, and thanks also for sharing in terms of uh, you know your definition of around um, sport, sponsorships, partnerships in, in the impact on the fan experience as well. And and also talking about, you know, the smartest brands have really, you know, being in the space, which leads us very nicely to 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 Lawrence. Uh, you know, of course we we know that My Republic is an official sponsor of the global esports games. And you know, wanted to also understand, you know, from your perspective as well, you know, uh, in terms of the readiness of brands for partnerships in esports and and you know what goes into your thinking around you know deciding you know which esports uh, property or, or event or you know or tournament to to partner with. Uh, thank you very much, Siaming, uh, and uh, thank you everyone for your very good comments. Actually, I find the other speakers have actually covered a lot of it and uh, key points like authenticity. I think those things are really important and uh, key points about commitment. Right. Uh, I think uh, before I answer your question, I think. Uh, key thing to always remember for esports is that uh, the end user is very different compared to other industries the engagement levels of the audience is very very high uh, most audience for esports are players themselves right that's one of the key differences right uh, and hence uh, sometimes calling them a fan base is not enough you have to call them a community because at the end of the day, they are players themselves as well. And uh, if brands want to come in, 
um, the difference between sponsorships and partnerships is partnerships is about engagement, right? So you have to be, have direct engagement with the end user community, not just throwing money and slapping a logo as uh, Carl has said. So based on that, uh, <laughs> uh, I would like to think we are also a smart company. We have been in the esports scene and the gaming scene since we established 10 years ago. And um, gaming has always been a very big part of the Minecraft DNA because a lot of us are gamers as well. Now, uh, how ready are brands to get in and how do we uh, target the right events or target the right uh, 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 projects to, to ensure that uh, we, we tap into the, to this space at the end of the day, the evaluation comes very simply, right? Uh, firstly, look at yourself, right? Um, I consider ourselves uh, uh, not directly in esports. Uh, we do have our own gaming tournament, but as a business, I'll consider ourselves a peripheral business around the esports industry, right? Uh, we are not directly always running esports. We do have our own tournament, but uh, as a main business, we are peripheral. And uh, that is, uh, at the end of the day, something that you have to define as a business yourself. How where are you right now and how do you want to engage? And where I believe that when brands come in, uh, how you want to look at a community is through value creation, right? That, that's the biggest part of getting into a community. If you can, like any community, if you, if you bring value, you'll be accepted, right? At the end of the day, if you bring good value to the community itself, you'll be accepted. So firstly, how can we help? How can we participate and how can we add value to that particular event? Uh, of course, uh, if you don't find that event is authentic, you don't participate. But if you find it's authentic, then it's about how do you uh, add create uh, value, right? Um, we invest and we participate in events from small to big uh, across the entire esports community. And um, it's never about how big it is. It's about how much value or the intentions behind the event to create. Right. Uh, even if it's a small neighborhood tournament, I would I would I would participate if it's creating the right value for the community, and and that in return comes back to you being authentic. Right. Uh, you are there to help grow the community. So uh, see where you are. Identify the strengths of your business. Identify the strengths of your brand, uh, and then take what you have and see how you can integrate it with the community integrate with the fan base. And you know, they I think that that's a very, very simple step for how brands can come in and also pick pick their battles. Thank you, Lawrence. And Ricardo, you, you've worked for some of the biggest brands in the world, uh, such as Visa and Coca-Cola. So, you know, from your perspective as well, what would brands be looking out for uh, when when evaluating this space? Well, I don't think brands know exactly what they're looking for when it comes to gaming. And that's one of the biggest problems that I see uh, today. There is a, a huge fear of being missing out things in gaming. And a lot of brands are jumping in without knowing exactly what they are trying to accomplish. I think in general, when you look at brands, uh, they, they may be coming to gaming for a couple of different reasons. So some of them, um, they invest because they are interested in talking to their uh, the audiences that are following gaming. So I'll give an example. Um, uh, the, the playing occasion or the watching occasion uh, comes with a lot of beverage consumption. So like any other uh, uh, you know, show on TV or video, uh, that's an, a, a beverage consumption occasion. So a lot of beverage brands, they advertise on Twitch and so on and so forth to be able to be seen during that occasion. So that's, you know, pure advertising. Then there is a, a, another group of brands that uh, want to be uh, part of the gaming through integration. And in, in this example, you see you know, a lot of placements, a lot of, uh, you know, it can, it can go from activity. So, I mean, I did, I did several initiatives with, you know, EA Sports for the FIFA game because Coca-Cola was you now is a sponsor of the FIFA World Cup. Uh, so this kind of integration, it's, I think it's a, a level a little bit deeper than the, the first one, which is just exposure. And then you have you know, uh, other brands and, uh, which you know, work through the community, um, you know, working with influencers, with gamers, et cetera, to be part of the conversation in a different way. 
to learn from them, uh, to feed them with information and things that may add value to the community, and so on and so forth. So I think it depends on the stage of development and the maturity of the brand to engage with game with gaming. Uh, they would opt for option one, two, or three. Some of them are doing all of them at the same time, depending on the country, depending on the occasion. Um, but I think that the, the most important thing is very few brands that I see today, they understand clearly where they are, what they need, and what they can ask for. And I think that's a... One of the biggest opportunities for no for everyone for publishers for agencies for consultants to guide them in in engaging in a way that they will benefit from not only signing a check or not only you know just uh, just claiming their part of it. Thanks, Ricardo, and that that also you know it's a very good point in terms of brands not being you know super clear about you know what they need and what they can ask for because this leads us to a next question, which is you know. Really, this is the opportunity for the esports industry at this panel right now to to talk about how ready esports is for partnerships, and you know, and what are the most valuable assets of esports for brands that they can look forward to. Um, maybe we'll, we'll start with Cat. You know, what are your thoughts on these? This is it's a great time for you to to talk to brands right now. Uh, thank you. So I think sponsors and partners are the crucial part of the ecosystem. So you know, uh, eSports originally ambassadors of marketing of the games in the beginning, and now it has really developed uh, its own unique way of commercialization. And in its independent commercial system, it consists of three major parts, copyright, sponsorship, and ticket. So you see sponsorship and partnership is, is a crucial thing to the eSports ecosystem. But also, um, compared to the traditional sports that we are talking uh, through uh, previously, I think the uh, true commercial value of esports still has a very long way to go. So there is definitely a huge market of uh, in esports for the partnership and sponsorship too. And uh, I, I, I agree what, what we were referring to that it's kind of being hard for the brand to seeking for the right partners or seeking for the right esports to collaborate with. So it's actually the same thing, same situation here in esports. We are actually seeking for the right partners, right brand to cooperate to here in the esports industry because we want to figure out whether they would like to invest in esports and the, whether they have the, um, the real social impact that we are looking for because from my perspective, I, I mentioned previously um, that uh, the partnership between esports and the brand, we're trying to tell some another story through that brand to the public. For example, that uh, uh, from uh, in the uh, previous time we might cooperate with some computers and hardware, and now we might cooperate with um, KFC, we might cooperate with Coca Cola or Red Bull or uh, um, many other clothing and um, shoes uh, average brand. We try to tell the public that esports is a uh, trend. It's a favorable thing that loved by many young generations. So this is the idea that we would like to pass. So we must find the right partners and right brand to do the uh, same things as we did. And uh, as for your next question, what are the most valuable assets for of esports to the brand? I think there are uh, two perspectives. Um, one is users and the other is the content. So um, as everyone knows that Esports, in many cases, are the games with a tremendous number of users. And also, um, esports itself has a large group of audience, it's obvious. And it's a fact that even if the players didn't play the game any longer, there are still 40% of the users will continue to pay attention to the esports competition. So I think esports is a way for the brand, also for the partners, to reach out to the users especially the young generations, and it will be a new way for them to collaborate with these interesting games because um, <laughs> it's hard to collaborate with the games and games didn't accept the sponsorship. And the other point is about the content. So esports itself is content, of course. We, uh, we watch the games, we watch the broadcast, we watch the streaming uh, platform. And also esports, it brings good and new content as well. Publishers actually invest a lot, not only in the competitions, but also the contents alongside the competitions, including players, uh, clubs, uh, KOLs on social media, things like this. 
So this brings opportunities to more brands who are interested in the sponsorship. For example, sometimes you will see one brand throughout the game because it's the top sponsor of the game. And the other might you will see particularly for the highlight time and the other for the uh, interview for the players. You also you will see the logo on uniform. And also sometimes you will see on the uh, screen platform. So this, of course, will bring more attention to the brand who sponsored the game and eventually empower the brand with the spirit of esports and the value of true competition. Uh, this is my idea on this question. Thank you. Um, Carlos, may I have your thoughts on, on these questions as well? Thank you. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, I, I want to piggyback on what Ricardo talked about because I think he said some really smart things. Um, I, I, I like to say that I spend half of my time saying that esports is very, very different. And then I spend the other half of my time just trying to tell people, yo, esports is just sports. Okay. And, and I, I like to start there because, uh, um, Certainly, we we are always in the mode of education because, you know, there just requires a lot of education in this space. But what I find really amazing when I meet a CMO or, or a marketing team is that sometimes I feel like their own level of preparedness is either like dialed down to zero, meaning they, they've kind of done no homework or they've, they've dialed it to 11 where, where there's like, they're like, they've read every single report and they're really, really tight around their definition. And then the question I kind of asked them is, is this the same process that you would do if you were evaluating the NBA or, or the NFL or, or, or FIFA? And so, um, and, and, and the, the, my advice to brands is that, yes, esports is different. Yes, th there are nuances to it. But like you should be applying the same level of scrutiny and, and analysis and preparedness that you do when you evaluate st stick and ball sports. Um, and uh, when I look at, you know, we, we've been very, very fortunate enough to, to work with, with some of the world's uh, best brands. Um, and what I can tell you is the one consistent thing among all of these uh, great brands that we worked with is that they have come in with a very good idea of what they want to get out of it. And, and that could be literally brand exposure. That can be, hey, I want to drive transactions. Oh, I want to collect emails. Whatever it is, by far, the number one signal of, and, and by the way, this is, this is very interesting because at the end of the day, you know, we're, we're selling our media platform. The, the number one factor, success factor, that I know that there's going to be a high probability that we're going to have a signed agreement is during that first conversation, if I get a sense that, hey, this company knows what it wants. When I have that first discussion with the brand and, it, and, it, and it, it, they're kind of dialed down to zero or they're dialed to 11, that's when I know, okay, the sales cycle is going to be hard here because either I'm going to have to educate them a lot or I'm going to have to kind of dial them down and, and, and bring them back in because they're, they're, they're maybe a little too hyped on the ecosystem. Um, and so that's my biggest advice is, is, is if you're a brand and you're looking to get in this space or reinvest in this space is know what you really want to get out of it. Um, and, and I know one of the questions is around kind of the ROI and the efficiency of, of well, that all depends on, your mentality and the objectives and the goals that the brand entered in with the first place. Like the worst case scenario for a brand and also its partners is that there isn't a clear definition of what winning is, right? Like, and that's, that's my second piece of advice is have a really good understanding of what, of what winning means for you in, in this space. Thanks. Thanks, Carlos. And, and you know, you, you mentioned about, you know, um, the brands that you count and encounter who really know what they want coming into this space. So, so about, I think to kind of better understand perhaps for, for other brands to understand what are, you know, maybe piggybacking on, on what these, uh, these brands who know what they're doing have been looking for. Could you also share a bit more about uh, in terms of like the kinds of assets that, that these brands have been looking out for? So when they come to you, they say, I know what I want. What, what is it that they, they have been looking for? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, as I, I kind of quasi pitched there in the very beginning about the, the platform of One Esports, 
you know, we're a fully integrated, fully scaled media company. And uh, the partners that we work with are, are, are brands that understand, as I said, that they got to they got to participate across the entire content flywheel and the fan experience to be successful uh, with, with this community. And so all the brands that we work with essentially participate in a lot of those things that we offer. The one example I'll give to you is Toomey. So Toomey is a travel brand. I mean, if you walk into a Toomey store, uh, you know, the, these products are not cheap. OK, the, the, this this is these are expensive, uh, incredibly well-made products, but they're not they're not, uh, you know, we're not talking to budget products here. Um, but they were incredibly smart. And they said, hey, like eventually these esports fans and players are going to fly business class and they're going to want a nice four wheeled roller. And so let's start future proofing our business. And they came in with this desire because they've, you know, actually they've learned that they, they, they've entered other spaces. They've entered the music space as well. And they learned from there and they took those learnings as they went to esports, and they realized that they came in and said, look, we want to lead with content because storytelling is the best way to really build that emotional linkage. And so when we started with Toomey, we literally started with content. And we brought in another partner, you know, talking about one plus one equals three. We brought in a team called Team Secret, one of the best teams in Dota 2. And they, they've expanded to this, particularly in Southeast Asia and other game titles. But we brought in their star captain, a guy named Puppy, who's only one of two um, uh, players in the history of Dota 2 to play in all TIs. I mean, this guy's like the Michael Jordan LeBron uh, of, of uh, Dota 2. We brought him to do a content piece. And that content piece was so successful. It was the best video content that Toomey had ever produced. And the, the content that it beat was the content that included a Hollywood, a Hollywood star. And one thing that I kind of joke with my sales team is we certainly didn't charge Hollywood dollars for, for that piece of content. But it started with content, okay? And then they got the event sponsorships, which is, you know, we call that like regular hygiene where you get exposure, you get, you build up, you get the, you get people to notice your brand. And while that was happening, there was a microsite where we were taking the power of our media platform to draw as many people into this microsite to educate them about Toomey product. And what they were also doing there, they were collecting emails. And why were they collecting emails? Because while all of this was happening, content creation, event sponsorships, education through a microsite, we were helping and advising Toomey to create real life gaming and esports products that could be offered through the store and e-commerce. And today, you can go to Toomey.com. You can walk into a Toomey store and you will see a specific product line designed for gamers and esports professionals, okay? That's what I mean by a brand really coming in and understanding, having a good strategy, picking the right partner that has the entire content flywheel, understands the ecosystem, and can take you from building awareness, doing storytelling, all the way to in real life products. Right. That's and, and we do that with all of our brands. I mean, they're um, all of our partners. And, and that's why they choose one esports, because they understand that to interact across the fan experience, across content, video, streaming, um, teams, data, all these things are super important in, in, in being convincing and showing that commitment that I talked about earlier. Thank, thank you, Carlos. And, and Carlos, you, you mentioned just now about. Um, return of investment, which is something that, you know, it is it is a hot button issue at the end of the day. We've talked about all of the potential around esports for sponsorships, for partnerships, but you know, it's 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 a word, it's it's a term that often comes up when, you know, ROI. So so you know it's it's something I would like to kind of like go, you know, around the panel or maybe starting with 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 Lawrence as as you know as as a as as a partner of, of gaming and esports events. You know, you've talked a bit about you know the the value that you see in, in events and how that aligns with your 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 brand identity, but but you know about return on investment. What what does that actually translate to you in you know as a managing director of a of of, of a company after all? Well, a bit of background of uh, My Republic. Uh, we are a telco. We are an internet service provider. We are a mobile provider, and uh, I'll say that uh, probably we are one of the targets for many of the esports platforms, especially when it comes into sponsorships and partnerships, right? Uh, and um, actually, uh, a lot of what Carlos said was good, right? Uh, 
we we had to go through that uh, process internally long time ago about uh, what it meant to us what are the key key performance indicators what are key drivers uh, when we go into every event when we invest every dollar how how much do we get back in terms of where our products are selling right um, just a bit of a background of our products uh, we have a particular gaming broadband uh, product the uh, we're kind of known as the gaming broadband of Singapore. Uh, and, you know, a lot of telcos actually want to come into that space because most of the uh, esports players have to use a good internet connection. But uh, I would say that uh, we were so far the only ones that really established ourselves in the gaming space. And uh, at the end of the day, it's about the same thing I said earlier. It's about tying down your product towards the community. And the product we identified was uh, gaming and uh, gaming broadband. But gaming broadband, anyone can call a broadband service gaming, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, where is the value at? Back to it, where is the value at? Our value at essentially was uh, latency monitoring, which is probably a very key feature that gamers want, right? Um, latency is essentially everything that uh, matters uh, in how fast you can go in a game and how fast you can respond. And that could be the critical difference between winning and losing. So uh, we we actually went through that process very early on, as mentioned. Uh, we looked at how every dollar and every event got us the amount of eyeballs that converted to a certain conversion rate that we were monitoring. And essentially... Eyeballs essentially is how relevant and how large that platform is and uh, that we participate in uh, this eSports event. And secondly, the conversion. The conversion is how relevant your product is to the community. Right? Uh, if your product is, uh, you cannot communicate a certain value, you cannot, uh, communication is very important. So if, even just stuffing your product there is not good enough. It's about trying to show that feature, trying to show that relevance, and trying to show that value creation. That part of it is about conversion, and you, you can't modify that as you go from one platform to the other and improve over time. Uh, the example Carlos gave about Tumi is very good, right? So they, they, they figured out what gave them that conversion or what gave them that, uh, that, 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 that change, right? Uh, we, we found out that uh, what really affected our conversion was um, how we convey the latency monitoring value, right? Uh, as we went into the events and we demonstrated our products, demonstrated our brand. We tied it back to that feature. We got better conversions and we kept improving on that. We developed content around that feature itself to help educate uh, the community that this is what we're doing. Uh, So eyeballs, then conversion rates was essential for me, but uh, that's just stats, right? So what you're doing in relevance, improving those numbers, I think that's very important. So essentially, that's how I how brands should look at ROI, and how they can measure themselves. I mean, that's one of the good ways. Thanks, Lawrence uh, and Ricardo. You know, uh, I think I think the brands you've worked with in the past are a bit more removed from the gaming and esports space. So, so what what are your thoughts around um, ROI and and efficiency when it comes to to investment in esports? Yeah, so I think it uh, it's important to to say that the when a brand decides. Uh, to invest in something to achieve a certain business objective, uh, they don't have in mind esports. They know that they have. They, don't, they I, I need to invest whatever to get to incremental revenue, incremental profit, incremental awareness, and then comes the decision: what's the best choice? So um, the, the 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 process is: I want to increase profit in Malaysia. What are my options to invest in Malaysia? Sometimes it's just advertising. Sometimes it's a sports sponsorship. Sometimes a gaming sponsorship. Sometimes it's just sampling product. Uh, and so this is the discussion that they have uh, before opting for, for gaming. Uh, so if the decision is to go to gaming, then uh, you are going to compare uh, the potential results that the gaming activity will generate with everything else that I'm telling you. And you know sometimes gaming has an advantage to be easier to measure. Sometimes it has the disadvantage, right? So I, I know that if I do, I mean, I'm just thinking about uh, uh, beverages or consumer goods in general. If I sample products, I probably have a history of 50 years sampling products. I know exactly the conversion that I'm going to get, right? I don't know the conversion that I'm going to get if I do uh, an investment in gaming. So that's 
that's a disadvantage of investing in gaming in this specific example. Um, in the other hand, when you think about uh, you know uh, how can I access a certain demographic, uh, you know uh, a, a sample is a horrible idea because you talk to everyone. Then you know gaming is an you know, excellent uh, choice because you know exactly who you're talking to. You know the profile. You know the behavior. So it's a lot more effective than than that. So the uh, the ROI in each company has its own models to calculate ROI will vary by you no know, specific uh, specific objectives. I developed two completely different models for ROI calculation. Uh, you know, in the the companies, the two companies that I worked for, they work really well. They predict really well the results, the the return, and they are completely different from one another. So you know, I guess brands need to you know to invest. They need to know what they want to do. And then they need to look at you know, eSports side by side with all of the other alternatives that they have in the market uh, to figure out what's best for them. Thank you, Ricardo. And, and turning to Ken, you know, when you hear about ROI, I think it's a very different concept because the context, because brands are asking you about ROI. So, so what are your, your, your thoughts on this? And, you know, and from the industry perspective, you know, you know how, how efficient uh, is eSports for ROI in terms of what, what you have encountered so far? Thank you. I think I can only answer from uh, the eSports perspective because um, just to follow Carlos example, his colleague is a good example uh, regarding to me. So um, uh, I want to follow in this example and, and try to give my answer. So the why uh, the reason that eSports is trying to collaborate in with such high-end um, brand is that when you think about football, when you think about basketball, sometimes we will figure out that there will be some um, protocol and some reception for the high-end customers, but also for the um, VIP sponsors. But when we look at eSports, we didn't see that seamlessly. All of the people come to the home arena and watch the same games in, 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 in the venue. So it's actually uh, the, the fact is that the traditional sports, including the, the, the football, the um, basketball, it kind of uh, was played by some rich guy like, <laughs> in, in a very long time ago. But youth sports, it kind of uh, grew from nowhere. It, uh, it was played by a, a large group of, large group of people uh, that they were just playing games at their hobby and their, at their interest. So sometimes that when he was trying to have this interaction with high-end brand, with this luxury brand, we are not only seeking for the revenue, we're not only seeking for the um, cash that goes into our accounts, but we're also thinking for this kind of certain social impact that we would like to get rid of uh, the idea that eSports is a grassroots hobby for things, that we want to um, convince the public that eSports is uh, kind of, uh, like I said, a lifestyle or an uh, uh, a interest that was loved by a lot of group of people, including the grassroots and including the high-end people. So this is the idea. So when he was trying to measure the ROI of the corporation or of the partnership, we will not only look at the revenue, but also the story that's told by this partnership. Thank you, Kat. And um, we're nearing the end of, of the panel session. So before we wrap up, I, I and, and we're also nearing the end of the year as well. So so I wanted to kind of, I think we're, we're all kind of starting to look ahead at the future, especially, you know, we're hoping that, you know, things ease up with the, with the pandemic next year. So I wanted to just, you know, at the end, quickly go around the panel to to just ask what 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 are you looking forward to in the next year or 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 to you know I mean we're not we're not quite sure how things will pan out there but what do you see ahead when it comes to partnerships around esports you know you, you you can you know use your own perspective or think of or, or something you're looking forward to as a trend in in the industry and so um, maybe we'll 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 start from Lawrence. Okay. Uh... I think uh, I'll, I'll say it from a brand perspective, right? What what I hope for, because uh, this is what I want to see. Uh, uh, I like to see more. I like to see more localization, right? Uh, I think that uh, we have a lot going on in the global esports space. Uh, I think that uh, either the the top global players have to localize more, so that uh, 
because you know if 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 you're if you're getting partnerships from big global brands, I think they are there already. A lot of them are aware of esports requirements. You aware that they have to get in the community. But there are a lot of localized brands that want to participate. But when we go into a platform, and uh, if the platform is not localized enough, we don't get the value we want to create. And yeah, the they our products are to a certain segment. We want to tap into that segment, and that segment might be local, right? Uh, and uh, so that's something that I would like to look forward to. And I also think it's very untapped, right? The, uh, not only is it cool to be part of that big top tier esports space, but local leagues are important as well, right? Uh, I think that uh, because the esports community is different from, uh, let's say, traditional sports communities where the engagement levels of the players themselves are so much higher, uh, where a lot of them are players themselves, there's so much opportunity to, to, to look at the local level. Right, bring it down to the country level, bring it down to the community level within the country, right? There's so many communities within the country. And uh, while that might be costly, uh, I think uh, that there are organizers out there. I think big global platforms can appoint these organizers as sub brands or sub uh, partners to run these events, right? And then that's where the local brands and the local partners who want that locality aspect of partnership can come in to get ex extremely more value, right? Target, how targeted it is, right? Um, as a brand, sometimes it's frustrating, right? The, we have brands coming to us, uh, we have platforms coming to us going like, uh, oh, would you like to partner with us? Then I look at the main audience uh, segmentation, oh, it's all in, all in the States, oh, it's all in China, it's all in uh, this part of the world. And uh, I go like, okay, that's frustrating. This, uh, you, what you guys are doing is really, really good. But uh, I'm not going to get the value for, for, for participating in it, right? I want to be involved. I love your idea, but I can't, right? Because it's, it's, it's so far away, right? So I think platforms need to start looking at how they can build a model to, to skill into localization, skill backwards, right? <laughs> how do you appoint local partners to run sub-events for you? Uh, and then local, partner, local brands can come and participate. Right, uh, that 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 is something I I, I hope and wish to see, right, uh, as a as a brand. Yeah. Thank you so much, Lawrence. Um, Ricardo, what are your thoughts? What are you looking forward to? Well, I'm I'm hoping that uh, all the things that we learned during the last year and a half, two years, uh, how to operate remotely, how to continue to engage remotely. Um, how to continue to deliver value to the community uh, in, in a non-presential way. Uh, we can carry that forward and add all the good things that we had before from a live event. So uh, we had a, a, a great life before with all the live events going on. We were deprived from all of this for two years. Uh, now we have the benefit of learning a lot from this period. And if you can bring these two lives together, I think the, the future for, you know, for marketing, for sports marketing, for gaming, it's all, all going to be so much better for, you know, for the fans, for the users, for the players. I think it's going to be um, a better experience for, for everyone. So I hope we are, we are all able as a community to do this. Thank you. Thank you, Ricardo. Uh, Carlos, your thoughts? Yeah. Um... Well, for, first of all, I, I, I just want to also just piggyback a little bit on what Lauren said, because I, I also think that's a pretty sharp and, and smart comment. You know, one of the reasons why One Esports has really kind of scaled incredibly fast in Southeast Asia is because we're when we started, we were literally and we were literally the only news esports news site that was in Bahasa, Tagalog, Thai and Vietnamese, and, and we were telling the stories of local esports heroes. I mean, that, that was certainly one of the contributors to how, why we've scaled so fast. Um, and so I think there's a lot uh, to learn from Lawrence and from the My Republic experience, particularly this idea of, of uh, at least on the competition level, on, on participating across the entire competitive pyramid. I, I from from big regional events, even global events, even down to the grassroots. I think there's a, a lot of smart um, uh, tactics there that brands can can pick up. Um, in terms of of how I think about the future, you know, on on one end, 
Um, I am incredibly bullish on esports and obviously one esports, our business, primarily because I continue to see smart brands realizing that they, they do have to participate across the entire content flywheel. They have to participate across the entire fan experience. And that's, you know, what we offer, you know, we're not a one trick pony. We, we offer the entire ecosystem um, in one shot. And so I, I think the solution that we offer brands um, is, is a very good one. So on that end, I'm incredibly bullish. Um, where I'm a little bit, you know, a, a bit bearish is I, I think the world's got to realize that after Omicron, there's going to be pi or rho, or I, I don't even know what the Greek alphabet is, but there's going to be a, a other variants of this thing. And, 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 um, and so I, I do sense um, in some of my discussions, a little bit of this, like, Hey, we're, we're kind of out of the wood, we're out of the woods and like everything's going to be normal next year. I, I would say to you, it's not going to be normal. I don't think it's going to be normal next year. I, I think. And so the advice that I would give to brands is I think you should prepare for a world where it's, it's going to be on and off again, regardless of what country you're in, whatever, regardless of what government you're, you're currently under it's, I think next year is still going to be on and off, um, which reinforces why I'm bullish, particularly about one esports, because, you know, we, that the offering the entire content flywheel offering the entire fan experience, frankly, is very resilient to an environment that's kind of on and off in, in terms of um, in-person live events. So um, I, I'm, I'm overall it's, it's December. I'm looking forward to my two week holiday to recharge, refresh, and get ready for an incredibly busy uh, 2022. Great, Carlos. Thank you. And finally, Kat, what are you looking forward to? Uh, so, thank you. So actually, the COVID uh, did make us uh, stay at home and office all day. We actually do provide the opportunities to use sports. This is an online concert. Everybody has nothing to do but watch these sports and playing game at home. So uh, from my perspective, I just simply look forward that Next year, everything when everything goes back to normal, hopefully there will be more brands that uh, would like to cooperate with esports, and there will be more interesting stories being told uh, next year, and uh, so that we can demonstrate that esports really kind of lifestyle and loved by so many young generations. And um, this is the way that we will promote the real social value, uh, the commercial value of esports, since it kind of have a great difference between the traditional sports, and also to promote the, the, the spirits of our competition, the spirits of sports, and all of our fans and users. Thank you, Kat. And you know, time has flown by, and unfortunately, our, our time is up, and we've come to the end of the panel discussion. Um, my thanks once again to Ricardo Ford founder of Sport by Ford Consulting, Carlos Alimurum, CEO of One Esports, Kat Gong, Senior Brand Manager of Tencent, Lawrence Chan, Managing Director of MyRepublic. Um, thank you so much for sharing your time and insight with us today. Um, and you know, thanks everybody for tuning in. I've been Ming, the moderator of, of this panel session. Have a great GFCon 21 ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.